Hi, my name is Julia Silge and I am a data scientist and software engineer at our studio. And today in this screencast, we're going to walk through this week's um, data set from Sliced, the competitive data science um, streaming show, live streaming show on Twitch. And what we're going to do is we're going to use it as an opportunity to talk about early stopping in XGBoost and how to do that with tidy models. Um, I've shown how to fit and tune actually boost a couple of times but I don't think I have talked about how to use early stopping um, early stopping is a good way to um, avoid overfitting it's a good way to be more effective with your tuning and so what we're gonna do is talk through how to um, tune the best value for early stopping and how it can help you if you are using um, XG boost the data set is about um, uh, shelter animals, uh, animals in animal shelters and what happens to them and how we can predict whether they'll be adopted or um, transferred or have no outcome, which is sad. So it's a multi-class um, uh, challenge, a multi-class classification problem. So um, it's uh, interesting in that sense as well. So let's um, uh, let's talk some about XGBoost, some about early stopping and some about uh, multi-class uh, evaluation metrics. All right, let's learn about XGBoost, early stopping, and shelter animals. So, my own two cats are shelter animals. So, naturally, I think that um, the outcome for all these shelter animals should be adoption. <clears throat> but sadly, it is not. I mean, most of them are, but we have um, no outcome and also uh, transfer. So no outcome, I think we generally understand to mean something not good, you know, not good happening to the animals and transfer as they're going somewhere else. We've got information about um, the animal itself. We've got an including some pretty interesting information about like breed and color and name, um, animal type. Um, it, during the episode of Slice this week, I, I did quite a bit of analysis of like the color and the breed and the name. But um, in this screencast, we are really just going to focus on uh, training a model with some basic features. So um, uh, we won't get into too much of that this time. Um, in order to get started, let's just do a couple of exploratory plots to give some context for the features that we are going to use, which are these more sort of basic, um, getting started kind of features. So let's start with that. Um, let's start with that. Uh, there, there's this feature that is age upon outcome, um, but it's, you know, that's not super parsable. For a like, it would be better if it was this was like a numeric value, like age in weeks or something like that. So let's talk about how to do that, how to get that, because we have over here the date of birth and the date time at the outcome. So we can we can process that and get that there. So if we do, um, so let's make a new age upon outcome, and let's see. So we're going to use Lubridate here. So we're going to say. Um, as period date time minus date of birth like that um oh yes okay so one of this is a date time and this is a date so let's do as date like oh gosh Ugh. that's not what i meant to do let's see view let's do this and do Okay, there we go. We're back to this. Let's, there we go. Okay, so now we have this, this um, column is now a period, which is a um, concept from Lubridate. And so now let's do one more um, transformation and let's say time length, which is a function from Lubridate. And we're gonna put that age upon outcome in there. And the unit that we're gonna put there is weeks. So what this does is this gives us now a numeric value. So this is the number of weeks. So this cat who used to be, we used to say, the cat was 
two years old. Now we say it's 120 weeks old. This one that was one year old is 52 weeks old, two months old, nine weeks old. So this is now the age in weeks, which I think is more useful. And now let's do just a visualization. So let's put that age upon outcome here and let's do fill by outcome type and then let's make a histogram. Um, let's say, let's make just a few bin, like less bins. Let's make alpha equals 0.5. So this is now a stacked bin. They're, they're just like all on top of each other. So if instead we want them uh, to take up the same, like kind of as if they were on, like in front of each other would look like this. And then the last thing, these are, these are in counts. So we see here, right? that the oh, no outcome is less than the transfer, which is less than the adoption. That is useful, but another way we might want to um, uh, visualize this is with um, as a density here. And so we can do it like this, and we can kind of see where, where those differences are. So if we want to change the labels, we might say age in weeks, and we don't need that on the um, legend. Nah, so pretty good. Okay, let's make one more um, exploratory part, plot before we get done. We get started with our modeling. So let's take that raw training data, 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 and let's say let's take that outcome type, and then let's instead of it has three things in it, and let's for now let's just look at adoption. So instead of um, saying. <clears throat> adoption, no outcome transfer. Now it just says true, false, true, false, true, false as um, in terms of who is adopted and not. And so let's group by week um, where we call week of the date time. So this is week of the year and weekday where weekday of the, so this is now day of the week and let's find the um, mean adoption rate. So this is for every week of the year and every um, day of the week. Uh, what is the mean adoption rate then? And we can make a visualization like a heat map. So week, weekday. And let's make the fill, the outcome type there. And we can use um, geom tile to make a heat map. And let us um, scale fill with my favorite Viridis. So if we do it, um, this is for continuous, which is what we have like this. Ooh, nice. So let's um, let's change those labels because this is oh not that. This is the percent um, of out out of adoption rate. So we can, we can change these labels. So fill, this is percent adoption rate. Um, so this is, just to be clear, week of the year, and this is day of the week, like that. All right, I think this is really nice. I like this a lot. So we have, um, we can really see some seasonal effects here. So we have on the bottom, um, as we move up, we go from Sunday to Saturday. So we see that on the weekends, the um, adoptions are high. And then we, as we go from um, left to right, we go through the year. And, I, you know, it looks like it's darker kind of in the middle. So it looks like it's higher, uh, you know, maybe around the holidays. Maybe more people are adopting around the holidays, perhaps. So this kind of heat map lets us see things, um, see these seasonal patterns, which I think is pretty nice, pretty good. All right, so there's lots more we could do with this data, um, but, but let's go ahead and get started on uh, building a model so we can talk about early stopping. So to get started with the model, let's load tidy models. Let's do our um, data, let's spend our data budget. Um, I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna copy and paste this. And then I'm going to pass it into initial split. I'm going to do stratified resampling on the outcome. And I'm going to call this shelter split 
like so. And then I will make shelter train, which calls training on the split. Shelter test, which calls testing on the split. And then I'm going to make some refold, some resampling folds. So let's um, let's make uh, cross validation folds. So I'll call that on the training data, like so. I'll do this resampled. I mean stratified as well. Outcome type, and let's call this shelter folds. While I'm here, let me set up um, some metrics. So I'm going to set up a metric set. So the default metrics in tidy models for a multi-class classification problem would be accuracy and ROC, AUC. But let's add um, mean log loss because that is what the um, that is what the the challenge during the slice was being evaluated on. So you can always, you know, add in something else that you want to, that you care about. So this is spending our data budget. We have a certain amount of data that has labels on it. So we need to decide how we are going to spend that. Next, let's talk about um, uh, feature engineering. So we are predicting outcome type. And we are going to do it with... Um, other things we've got in here. So let's see. Um, so let's use that age upon outcome a feature that we created. Let's put in animal type. Let's put in that date time. So when did this event, this outcome happen? The adoption or the transfer or whatever. Um, let's put in sex, spay, neuter, um, and, and let's, let's call that good enough. So I'm sure we could do better by like incorporating breed information, maybe color information and so on, but we are just gonna stay with that. So let's, uh, put in the, the training data here. And then let us, um, start to do our feature engineering. For example, step date. Um, we're going to take that date time object and create features like um, um, day of the week, um, week of the year, and let's also put in year in case there's kind of like a like a um, uh, like a long term change. So we're looking for different level features at different levels of time, and we can um, uh, remove that. Um, the date time by doing keep original calls false, we remove the original column. Now let's create um, dummy or indicator variables for all these nominal predictors. So that's things like um, spay, neuter, animal type. And if we do one hot equals true, um, this it will keep all the levels. So for example, if uh, uh, in spay, neuter, I think it's like um, intact, neutered and unknown and um, this will keep all three instead of uh, removing the the base level and so we, in a linear model you want to remove the base level or the linear model will you know fail but for a tree based model or like boosted tree it can sometimes help you to have all of them the way that it does the splits um, so we will keep it all there and then i'm gonna do uh this filter of is, is remove anything that has zero variance. So send anything that's like all the entirely the same. Um, I mean, I think that's probably unlikely, but I'm just gonna put that there to be safe. And then I'm, I'm gonna prep the recipe. The reason I'm gonna prep the recipe is just to make sure that it doesn't fail, that nothing is, um, that nothing is unusual, <laughs> that nothing is not working the way I think it's going to. So, you know, we created these, um, we created these du these dummy variables here, um, and it all looks good. And now it is time for us to talk about early stopping. So let us make a boosted tree model. Um, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to um, I'm not going to tune the number of trees. I'm going to set it kind of medium. And, you know, it might be better if I set it higher. I'm going to set it kind of medium. I'm going to set M try. I'm going to tune it. Let's look here. Um, so M try 
is um, at all the splits as it goes down. Um, what M try is how many pr predictors um, do we do we sample at each split? Like, like how many do we show um, the the you know the learner at each split? Then I'm gonna I'm gonna tune the learn the the learn rate. I'm gonna tune. Um, stop iter is the other thing I'm going to tune. So that is, um, this is the early stopping parameter. How many iterations, like boosting iterations, do you have to go through without stopping? So that's the thing. That's, that is the early stopping thing. So I'm not saying stop early after 10 iterations. I'm actually going to tune and find the best early stopping um, parameter. So I'm going to set this engine, I'm going to say XGBoost, and then I'm going to set this um, engine specific parameter of validation, which is a, a proportion of the data. And so any data that get pa gets passed through the XGBoost, I'm going to say um, hold out 20% of it as validation data and um, use that to decide if, um, if the model is getting better or not. And if it's not, then stop. Don't keep going and training and boosting for forever. Just stop. And this is a classification problem. So this is my um, early stopping model specification. Um, the next thing that I want to do here is I want to make a grid of uh, possible parameters to try. So I am going to use not a regular grid, but like one of these irregular grids that can cover the space a bit more efficiently. Um, so I'm going to put something in here. I want to control this a little bit more than I would otherwise. So I'm going to say, I don't have to name this, I guess. So I'm going to say, um, uh, like the default is starting at one. <laughs> so like one, um, one one um parameter so let's let's start at five and let's go up to 20 or i don't know 20 let's see so if we prep the recipe um bake new data no like this uh, so there's 22 so i could go all the way up to 21 so let's go up to 20 um let's do learn rate uh let's i don't need to go so small let's do minus five minus one, um, and let's do stop iter. I'm gonna start, I'm not, let's see, three to 20. I'm gonna do 10 to 50, actually. I'm gonna let it go longer, and I'm gonna set a size. So we're gonna try 10, 10 per possible models. Uh, possible sets of parameters, hyperparameters. So these are hyperparameters of XGBoost, and we're going to try 10 different possible um, combinations. Notice that they, they are chosen to try to cover this three-dimensional space pretty efficiently without um, making a regular grid. Okay, now let's put it together. Let's call it early stop workflow. And let's make a workflow, and let's put the first argument as the recipe. The second argument as the um, model specification. And then I am going to set up my parallel backend, set a seed, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tune the grid. So that means I'm going to tune for every one of my folds. I'm, for the 10 folds, I'm going to try the E, for each fold, I'm going to try each parameter. So I'm going to tune 100 XGBoost models. So let's say early stop workflow, shelter folds. Um, the grid is the stopping grid. And the metrics are those shelter metrics that I said here. So let's call this stopping result, like so. Okay, and let's... Get, let's start it. Okay, so what is this doing? Um, for every resample, it's going to the analysis set of the resample and fitting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 possible models. But when it goes to XGBoost, it actually doesn't send all that data to XGBoost. What it does, it says it sends 80% of the data at XGBoost. 
Um, well, it sends all the data to XGBoost, but then XGBoost trains on 80% of the data and 20% of the data it holds back and says, um, I'm going to use this and check and see how the model is doing. Is it getting better or is it not getting better? And when it stops getting better, I am going to stop training. I, I'm going to do the early stopping based on what we told it in terms of um, early stopping. Um, and then when it comes back to tidy models, it is going to use this data to evaluate and see how each one of these four options did. So the unit, the stop iter starts at around, you know, 12. It goes up to like about 50 or over, over, over 50 or something like that. So it's going to go through and do that um, and train on a subset of this and see if it needs to stop or do early stopping or not, and then keep going. So it'll keep going through and do that over and over. So I, um, this is the, um, the you know, in, in, in XGBoost, that is the number of boosted, like boosting iterations. Um, so it will um, decide, it, you know, does it need to go through and do all that or not? So let's let this go. This is going to take a while, um, even with early stopping, which may, means, you know, it can stop early. <laughs> this is still a lot of models to go through. So let's let this go, and then I'll pause the video and come back when it is done. All right, the model has finished tuning. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so things look good. Let's start by um, visualizing the results. All right. Oh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna change. It doesn't look good with um, theme minimal, which is what that other thing is based on. So let's uh, do it like this. And let's zoom in and take a look. So we had three metrics that we were tuning with and three tuning parameters. So we've got this, you know, three by three grid and we can see the learning rate. Um, uh, we definitely, you know, we're doing better in this like really big step size in the learning rate. And then we can kind of see how all, everything else did here. So um, that is looking that is looking pretty good. And if we look at what what was the, you know, the best result here. <clears throat> we get, so we got something with a log loss around 0.502. And so during slice, that would have been, um, you know, pretty competitive. That would have been um, second place, which is what I actually got. And so to do better than this, we would probably want to, t uh, you know, br uh, bring in some information from, um, from the breed, like color, uh, maybe even like, does the name exist or not? And then also, you know, this is just a single model. And so we can ensemble models together to get better results. Um, okay, so once we have a model that we're happy with, See, let's do this so it's not so close to the bottom. What we can do is we can um, take the workflow. So this one, remember, is tunable. And then we can finalize it, finalize workflow with the, um, the optimal result from our tuning result. So I'm going to choose the one that has the best log loss like that. So before, these were tunable results, and now these are... Uh, they, you know, you have specific values like this value for the learning rate, um, this value for M try, this value for the early stopping. And then I'm going to pipe this to last fit um, with the data split, the, tu the tr t training testing split. And let's call this stopping fit. So, and um, let's, let's uh, run that. So what's happening is now we're going to the whole training set and I'm saying, okay, XGBoost fit my whole training set, but um, stop, just train and train, but um, uh, stop training if there's no um, improvement 
after this many iterations. And so I found that value by tuning on um, the resamples. So it is done. And so it has, it has now finished. So we've got, um, this is a, this is a, um, uh, a result of last fit and the res uh, last fit results, we can do things like get out the metrics. And these are metrics on the testing set. And so this is, uh, let's see, we can kind of compare these to, um, I forgot to put in the log loss there. So we can compare this to what we got on the, um, <clears throat> on all our resamples and it looks, you know, pretty good about the same. This is about what we would expect to get. Uh, we also can, you know, do other things, for example, with, with these results. Like let's look at variable importance. So I'm gonna do with um, the VIP package, I'm gonna extract the workflow from the last fit object. And so this object here, I can save it um, and use it for prediction later. Like I can save it maybe as an RDS, load it back and um, save it for prediction later. And I can extract the parsnip fit that is inside of it and then I can call VIP. So let's say, uh, let's say we want to see 15 features. I'm gonna do um, points because I like how that looks. And I am going to, so what we're doing is we're saying, what are the most important features for um, this XGBoost model? So the age of the pet of the animal is the most important, whether they're spayed or neutered, um, the animal type, um, that date time, the week, the week of the year. Remember we saw that seasonal effect where we, there were more adoptions around the holidays. Um, and we see cat dog, day of the week, Saturday, when we saw there were no more adoptions on the weekends. So we see these, um, these, these, these are the features that the XGBoost says are most important. Um, so we looked at metrics, we looked at uh, uh, feature importance. Next, let's look at the predictions from the test set like this. So these are predictions on the test set. So we have, um, uh, this is, these are, uh, predicted probabilities of adoption, no outcome transfer. This is the predicted class. And then this down here was the real value. So we can do something like, um, like an ROC curve. So what we would do is we would pass in the truth. And then in this case, since it's multi-class um, adoption, all the way, let, let, pass in all of the um, predicted, all of the predicted probabilities here. And so we get ROC curves for all of these and we can pass this to auto plot. And we get uh, the three ROC curves for these three classes. They have different shapes, which I think is pretty interesting. Like at different thresholds, it is um, different. Like there's, uh, there were a lot more adoptions than others. So that's probably you know, why this happens. Um, we could have maybe tried to um, balance this if we want, maybe. Um, if you want to see this all on one plot, it we have the underlying data there, so we can just go through and do that if we like. Um, I'll save that as an exercise for the reader of the of the ggplot your ggplot skills. Um, the the another thing you know that might be able we might be able to see this kind of like why is it harder for one to predict one class than the other? The other way we can maybe see that is by doing a confusion matrix. So we can put in again the truth and then the predicted class here. So we see here like, you know, of course there's a lot more adoptions than other classes and we can, um, see that, you know, we're much more successful also at predicting that majority class, which this is so, so, so common for this to happen. And so, you know, visualizing it, visualizing the confusion matrix just really brings us home, right? Um, we learned um, very well how to predict the majority class. And we might, you know, want to take, uh, try to do some, um, downsampling or upsampling or something to try to do a better job at some of these other classes to see if that will, that would help us or not. That might be, you know, something I would try to do next, actually. I think that's, a, that might be a pretty interesting thing to try. 
All right, we did it. We used um, XGBoost for predicting the outcome uh, for animals in animal shelters. Obviously, they need to all be adopted is the right is the right outcome. But um, we we use the XGBoost particularly. We used early stopping to be able to um, uh, as a way to avoid overfitting with you know this boosted tree algorithm and to be able to um, not just keep boosting and boosting them forever um, if it's not getting any better. Um, so early stopping is really uh, useful in a lot of situations, and um, I'm, I'm actually going to be on Slice again this coming week um, in the final four. So we'll see. I think I probably would plan to use um, early stopping again because it is useful in those kind of circumstances. So I hope this was helpful and I will see you next time.